All right, I've started the recording. You guys should see the agenda up on your screen. Thank you, Beth. Appreciate your, your help on all of this. Um, first welcome. item on the agenda is a request for agenda items. Is there any additional agenda items to be added to what we have here? Hearing none, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. Approval of the March meeting minutes. Do I have a motion approving the minutes or any concerns about what's in the minutes? Ms. Perry, I'll move to approve. Thank you, Perry. Do I have a second? I'll second. This is Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so we'll we can do this by raise of hand or or lack of absent or lack of, of no. So say yes if you yes or raise your hand. So yes, I approve the minutes. Nod your head, whatever. If you think no, now is your time to make that signal. Seeing none and seeing no little hands popping up, I'm going to assume that the minutes are approved and. Uh, We'll go on to our next item, committee reports. And the only committee we have on there is the cataloging committee. Um, is that report ready to be delivered? All right, um, I can give a brief overview. Um, the cataloging committee met on April 5th. Um, their main topics of discussion um, were the mark tag 999 and the importance of adding that correctly to records and being consistent um, because it does um, allow proper scoping um, of our searches. The other thing that was covered was local subject headings and um, also the use of parts um, and a demonstration was given on that. So it's just a real brief overview, but a lot of uh, good information that was shared with um, catalogers who attended. And those meetings are recorded and available for, for folks to watch too um, on the YouTube channel. Any Great. questions? Well, we're a talkative group this morning. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, John, I believe you're next on our agenda for a server upgrade status. Helps if I unmute myself. Um, so let's see, the physical new database servers are online, they're racked, they have the new operating system installed and the Postgres SQL uh, is installed as well. So those, that portion is ready to go for Equinox to, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, um, to kind of speed up the process and reduce downtime, we're gonna have Galen over at Equinox do a copy of the database from the existing servers to the new servers now. So as soon, uh, there is an additional ethernet port on the old server that's not being used and Tim's gonna, at EOU is going to make sure that it's on the new sub network. So we're using this opportunity to move everything over to a secure sub network that will house all the new servers. And so you'll add that connection. We'll get together with Equinox and go ahead and port everything over from the database to the new servers. Um, we already have the app servers and uh, the balance servers on the new system set up. So we still have to do the log servers and uh, we're gonna break out SIP and Z3950 as well as the uh, Nagios Isinga. It's a monitoring software that tells me what servers are up, what services are up. Rather than having all of those things live on the log server, <clears throat> we're gonna split them out into small VMs so that way, if one of them needs reset, it doesn't affect anything else. 
<clears throat> excuse me. Um, and then uh, the other benefit that we want to do with the new setup is so we're going to have uh, redundant uh, load balancers. So all web requests for information through the OPAC will go through the load balancer like they do now. But if for some reason there's a problem with that load balancer and it goes down, there's a, a redundant copy that will automatically kick in. So that way we should have much reduced downtime. Um, and then uh, once the two app servers are completely up and we're ready to use it, we're also going to split those so that we have four app servers. So that way, if we we shouldn't have any spike issues like we've had recently, um, well, especially the ones that we had way back when. Um, and then we're also going to do redundant log server VMs for the same thing. So if one goes down, the other one can immediately come in place. Like if the reporter module locks up or we get stuck reports or something, which is I think what happened yesterday with the app server spike, because we had a stuck report that was chugging away. Um, so I'm meeting with Tim at EOU later this week to go over what need, next steps we need to do. Uh, meeting with, uh, we've been talking with Galen about doing the database backup onto the new servers. And uh, so we've got the new cables for the existing NAS for when it goes over, because the, the new subnet is going to be a 10 gigabit network instead of one gigabit. So that'll also increase the ability for you know requests and just make the system better. Um, it is the new system is set up in the new data center at EOU. And so everything's in a separate locked area for access. Uh, I think that's everything. Did that any of that make sense? <laughs> sure, sorry. I, I'm sorry, yeah. I, I, it wasn't as, <laughs> I, I was more disjointed than I usually am, I'm sorry. No, so. it's, um, I, I guess one of the questions I have for you, John, um, you know, in light of, of what's happened in other vicinities, and I know I have a finance director that is constantly worried about our network security and not being hijacked. Where do you feel like we're at on that as an issue? Well, that that's why I'm so excited about going to this new sub network. Okay. Only, the only device that can con connect from one to the other is the load balancer. Technically, the um, test server will be able to do that as well, but all data has to go through the EOU firewall, through the load balancer to hit the app, the app servers and the um, Z39 and SIP. But right now, it's not, the, the term is sandboxed, so it's kind of, you know, its own unit. Right now, our current network isn't, and we have had some concerns about like uh, over anxious students on campus doing, looking through the networks and seeing what's available and trying to access things that they shouldn't. I don't, we're not aware of any issues with that actually happening, but that won't even be possible going forward with the new network because we will be completely isolated. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that because it reduces all of those concerns because I had locked down some ports on the existing setup to try and minimize that. And I don't even have to worry about that now. So, um, and like when we were having those really huge spikes, Tim and I were looking at the traffic and we didn't really see anything that stood out as not valid. But being a, I learned some things of how to actually distinguish what's coming in that I didn't know before, and and b, we were able to verify that the existing setup was secure enough that we were okay. So I feel a lot better about the new setup. Does that 
Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. We don't have to worry about our oil getting through the pipeline now. No. And and that's why um, one of the things I want to do is, and, and we're still debating whether or not we're going to do it, is to take the old one of the old servers and use it as an a redundant database server. So we'll have the production database server, the backup server, and then if we keep one of the old ones, if if the production one goes down for some reason, we can then switch over to the backup and still have an additional backup. So instead of having just one backup like we do right now, we would have two live backups. And so that way we're trying to build as much redundancy as we can into the system so that if any one piece you know, glitches, breaks, whatever, downtime is minimal and we won't lose any data. That's why, I mean, that's why we got the NAS was to make sure we have backup copies going to there as well. So. Okay. Other questions for John? Thank you, John, appreciate that. No problem. Um, when when do you expect to actually uh, do the transfer then, or do we have a date yet? Uh, we don't have a solid date yet. Um, we'll know more once Galen does the backup and once I talk to Tim about what his expectation is for getting the rest of the VMs online. So, what, but, What's your outside date at this point, do you think? Well, we were talking about the latest of being early June. I'm, I'm hoping to still hit that, if not before. So yeah, I that's, can update that's, the council once I hear from Tim. Yeah, and that's just getting the oh, hardware ready. Um, the, the next topic is the Evergreen update. And um, okay. I don't have a date for that as either um, because we've been waiting for this hardware switchover. Um, I'm hoping to get a more definitive date from Equinox maybe next week, um, at least a ballpark figure. My thought is, um, you know, maybe late June for um, the Evergreen update, but I'll communicate that out to everyone once we have a okay. more definitive date. Um, are we ready to move on to your update then on the Evergreen? Uh, that's I was just sharing that. So we're actually <laughs> one, one step farther um, in the agenda. Since it was kind of overlapping, I thought I would jump in and say, um, and then down farther in the agenda, if if we want to take the time, um, I've got um, a demo that Equinox put together that I can show um, so that um, if you want to see some of the features of 3.6, we can do that, or we can do it in a separate meeting. So that's optional. How long does the uh, how long does that take typically, or what what is the runtime on your demonstration? Um, the whole demo was um, probably 50 minutes. Um, so yeah, anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes. So we can see how folks feel at the end of the meeting um, as far as how long they can stick around to see that. I think there's some really interesting things. Um, I'll, I'll just give a brief overview. Um, so the, the demo shows some features of the new Angular staff catalog um, and how searches and the look of some of the things on the page, um, talks about the um, course reserves module that has been added to Evergreen, which is a wonderful feature for colleges, community colleges, and um, also a new hopeless holds feature that helps you track down um, when holds can't be filled. Um, yeah, so that's, those are the main things that the demo covers. Okay. Uh, anything else at this time, Beth, or should we move nope. forward? Let's move forward. Okay. 
Perry, I see you next on our uh, agenda here, budget and year end adjustments or year adjustment, end of year adjustments. Yes, there we go. I can read. Yeah. The summer reading program has been wonderful for me. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, so I've put a link to the budget in the chat if you want to pull that up. Um, Perry, the do you, changes are pretty. Do you want me to do I share your screen? Sorry. Would that yeah, make it easier? Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, I just made you presenter. Okay. So what we're concerned with today on the left hand side of this center white column, the darker purple column is the current adopted budget. The yellow is the actual income and expenditures and then a couple of uh, comparison columns. And the revised budget that we need to adopt today. So the red is showing uh, line items that are kind of high and those that are projected to go over or need adjustment just so we don't um, get out of compliance with our legal budget and get bad marks on our audit at the end of the year um, are changed and you can see the, the changes in that uh, column L. So basically we're adjusting the uh, starting cash balance. We projected 190 and we actually have 175. We're adjusting that down. I actually have 172, so budgeting 175. It's adjusted down. Um, also fixing the social security lines since Beth uh, opted out of the health insurance and we bundled that into the salary that changed the calculation for social security withholding. So we're adjusting, correcting that to actual. We've spent some extra money out of contingency for extra time uh, hours for Equinox for this upcoming uh, upgrade. And that is the 7,500 adjustment into technology here that is taken out of this line below here that you'll see the uh, the 5,000 reduced to contingency and that the other 2,500 is just adjustments from uh, the other lines here so supplies we're increasing a little bit um, I think there's some information on what those were. Oh, cabling and, and such for our new uh, servers were needed for those. Pumping that up. Of course, travel and training is down, so we're bumping that down. And uh, we're, we've paid out the last portion of the membership credits that we've been holding on to. Um, so that zeroes that out. That's $2,600. So we can get that off of our books. And then in the reserve funds, as I mentioned, the contingency is the only reduction there. That'll bring our end fund balance to about 132,000. That should still be okay to have us operate next year from July to when we get our member dues in. Um, but we'll try to bump that up over the years, get it back close to 150. Any questions? Perry, are there any areas of concern that you have based on what you're looking at there? Anything specific? No, we're, I mean, we've spent out some money out of our capital outlay and our contingency, so that's reduced, but um, those are for our server replacements. That's the the exact purpose of those funds 
Right. And hopefully we have warranties for a few years on the, on the equipment oh. that we got. So we should be good yeah. to, to build those up over the years. That's my, my only concern is, you know, getting the, as we've talked about, um, the salary structure built up to a capacity where we can replace either of our um, technical support staff, our admin, and John, um, which we're working towards. So I think we're still a little bit low on that. Uh, there's not much we can do about it right now, but that's a strategic right. uh, thing to be concerned with in the future. Other comments or concerns? Is there any action that we need to take on this, Barry? Yeah, since this is a change to the budget, we do need approval. We need to make a motion to approve the amended budget? Yes, please. Okay, I will do that then. This is Ryan and Legrand. I'll make a motion to accept the amendment to the budget or adjustment to the budget, I guess. This is Ann, I'll second it. Thank you, Ryan and Ann. Uh, we'll take a vote at this time. Again, raise your voice, raise your hand. If that's a positive for yes to approve the uh, motion. All right, are there any opposed to the motion? Seeing no hands go up, no heads wobbling back and forth. We will assume that that is unanimously approved. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Perry. I appreciate your work on the budget. All right. Uh-oh, I don't have an agenda in front of me anymore. <laughs> so I'm going to make myself presenter again. That's fine. Okay, sure. All right, you should see the agenda again. There we go. Okay. Um, council openings for upcoming fiscal year. We have four council openings. Yes. Um, so four of our current council members are due to leave the board. Um, on July 1. So between now and then, um, we'll have to get um, volunteers, nominees for those particular positions. And uh, I thought what I'd do is send out an email to um, the general listserv and then um, try to come up with some some names and if any of you guys have ideas of people that we should contact directly um, that would be wonderful um, basically we'd like to we'd like to prioritize filling these positions with people who haven't served recently um, just so that we can broaden um, the depth of the council and uh, bring more people into the group so that's what that's about. What's our uh, timeline for election on that, Beth? Um, basically, those positions are chosen or voted on, sorry, um, by the members in their membership group. Um, so once we have candidates, um, then we would send out um, a vote to the individual groups. Um, in summary, um, we've got a circulating schools position. Um, Anne is due to go off. Um, let's see another position. I'm looking at the website. Um, Deneen in Enterprise. Um, is due to go off in the, so public library is under 5,000. Um, public libraries, five to 15,000. Kathy Street is due to go off. 
and then um, mark your position ends um, and that's public libraries over 15,000 so those are the four okay. positions we've got open and uh, like I said those are the ones that I'll put out in the email to the general listserv asking for volunteers and of course people who have served before are are welcome to toss their name back in the hat um, it's just uh, we want to also open up to other folks too if there's somebody out there that's willing to serve has the sage council ever discussed incentivizing being on the council um, we have discussed it briefly. I don't know that we came up with a um, a definitive answer to that, um, but it certainly can be discussed now if if the council wants to. I think I had played around with some structures uh, on that concept with the the budget revision comprehensive budget uh, membership dues distribution that I'd come up with a couple of years ago now like uh, applying a credit to the uh, member billings for serving on the council so I was hoping for go ahead I'm sorry. Well, I guess I, I was wondering whether folks feel it's necessary. Are people not participating because they're, they don't feel it as an incentive to participate? I mean, I think that's uh, you know, I know I value having SAGE available to us and being part of SAGE, um, and I think it's worth my time. Um, and frankly, I rely on Beth and, and Perry much more than I probably should as chair. But, um, you know, it's, it's, I know it's an, it's, a, it's an organization we need and we need to, to keep it working well. And while I, I may be going off, I'm, I'm anticipating asking a staff member here to at least put her hat in the ring um, to see, so that we have people that will fill the, the different spots that we have. I agree. I believe it's a very necessary thing. And I think I rely on Beth and Mark and you and Perry and everybody way more than I probably should. And the cataloging committee and everybody else. I feel sad to think that we have to offer a financial incentive, that people aren't motivated enough to be a part of it. Um, but whatever it takes, I guess. I don't know, I guess that's the way of the world right now. Everybody needs an incentive financially to do anything. But yeah, anyway. Clearly not <laughs> enough power hungry dictators in the library world. <laughs> Clearly not. <laughs> I guess that's a positive take, Ryan. <laughs> well, let's see. Let's see what we get um, as far as volunteers and nominations. Um, and then if if we're struggling, um, we can bring this discussion back to the table. Well, you know, to me, the, the other idea is to simply, you know, have, to make have a way of doing a random drawing of if you're in this library group somebody from that group has to represent so there's five libraries in that group one of the five of you is going to be it if we have to do it by random drawing then <laughs> we make an assignment oh but you know i don't think anybody really wants us to do it that way either but i think maybe that's incentive i don't want to have to get told what i have to do so i'll buy because I you know like I've got things coming up in the next couple of years where well well what's going on in stage is important I need to back away from some things so that I can do some other things in the community and with my family so you know I've appreciated this opportunity to work here with everybody but I know I'm going to need a little extra time for other things in the next couple of years 
Yeah, that's not a bad idea to have a rotating schedule and have uh, members trade. I would like to see that yeah. before we offer an ins a financial incentive. Yeah, couldn't you just make it a requirement that everybody has to serve once every five or eight or ten years or whatever? At least one position. Not necessarily as chair or vice chair, but as a council member in general. Yeah, that's not a bad idea yeah. for the for the serving on the board uh, for everybody. But um, traditionally, our officer positions have been held by our larger members, so we could have rotating schedule for officer mm -hmm. positions among those. Yeah. <laughs> okay. My idea wasn't so crazy yet. No, it's not. I'm wondering if we want to enforce this um, or add this to our policy that we might need to make a bylaws change. Um, so do we want to see what happens this year and look at making at changing our bylaws for the following year? Depending on what happens or just do it regardless of what happens. Yeah. I yes, just yeah. Okay. I like I like the idea of seeing if we can get volunteers as the first option. Okay. Do, do yeah. we want to pose it as we're asking for volunteers? If we struggle to get volunteers, we will look at a change in the coming year that will include making assignments. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that the way we want to propose it then? Mm -hmm. So that it's sure. not it's not just volunteer this year, please, and next year we shove it down their throats. We uh, you know we tell them this year that uh, we want you to volunteer, and if you don't, we're going to change the bylaws and we're going to make you volunteer. We're going to volunteer you. <laughs> yeah. Can I, can I play devil's advocate a little bit here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm thinking in terms of how oftentimes we don't have a full council anyway. I'm concerned that if we force it, then we may have even less of that representation. So you're saying, Dia, that so, people wouldn't attend uh, meetings potentially? Potentially. I mean, if, if they're forced to take the role, they may just choose not to show up. Yeah, mm -hmm. on a more regular basis than. I think that's it's a just concern. a concern that came to my mind. It's a good concern, and many of the smaller libraries, if they get put in a position, won't don't have the extra time to attend the meetings or participate. So that's kind of been that's some of the some of what I've heard some of the people say that I mentor in cataloging. They want to get more involved, but they don't have the time or the opportunity to get more involved. Okay, well, let's see how this, this process goes, and then we can proceed. Um, hopefully, we won't have to resort to requiring folks. Yeah, I don't know. I was looking at that list that Perry put up on the lift serve of the, the officer history, and there's a lot of libraries on there that are at least as large as Legrand that have never had anybody in those officer positions. And I've done it twice myself, so, you mm -hmm. know. And I am neither a director or a department head in a library. I'm just a library technician. So. The, just a comment. This is Kathleen. I kind of like the incentive option better than the voluntary option, just because I think it might have a better outcome with meeting attendance. Yeah. Also That's, true. Yeah. If if we have to and resort to, yeah, it would incentivize people. Um, mm -hmm. But it's 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 kind of more of a positive than a negative. Um, right. 
when you're forcing people to serve. Um, so I think that's one of the things we'll have to look at is is which is which is a more positive outcome. And how large would that incentive need to be for it to be an incentive? Right. And Heather has an interesting point in the chat, which is that if we start incentivizing it and new people volunteer and then they don't show up, could they lose part or all of their incentive for being on the board? <laughs> Which is not a bad idea either. No, it's yeah, not. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. it would be a it would be a credit per attendance for the year that would be applied to their next year billing. Oh, that That's makes that sense. Work. Yeah. Yeah. And do we? Rachel is smiling. Thinking about something there. I was thinking that, um, you know, if we're going to offer incentives for council positions, then do we offer additional incentives for being chair and vice chair? You know, per meeting, um, because obviously that's a time obligation, um, a responsibility. So something to think about. Um, as we're debating about whether this is going to be necessary or not. Um, and, and what that figure would look like if we were doing a monetary for meeting. There's some, uh, there's some dollars that we'd have to really consider. How, how would those be worked and managed? Um, I know that uh, we've looked at the budget or the costing uh, previously. We didn't really come to a conclusion on that, have we yet, Barry? Or, um, and we still got to go back and revisit that at some point. Um, this certainly would have an impact on that as well. Not, not the same kind of impact as the other decisions we would be making, but still, uh, you know, if you're going to do credits at some point there, that's a, that's a financial issue. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Less, less income. That would be. Yeah. That would have to be uh, distributed among the other members for sure. So. Well. Um. That's even more incentive to volunteer then. <laughs> that way you're the one getting the credit instead of getting the slightly larger expense. You know? Yeah. I bet everybody's going yeah, to volunteer then if we don't actually have an election. Yeah. If we had a $100 credit a meeting, that's almost half of some of our members' whole membership fee. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything more that we need to do on the uh, opening for the upcoming fiscal year? Are we beat this one to a, to a pulp or are we <laughs> want to hit it some more? No, I think we're good. Just want to make sure we got a dead horse and we're not dragging it too far. <laughs> so, okay. All right. So we are at the point where we can make a decision of whether we want to talk about whatever's on our mind or look into the evergreen features. Um, what is everyone's desire? I'd love to see the features. I do have to duck out at 11 for another meeting though, but. Me too. Well, the, watch other, the, recording later. Well, the other possibility is that um, I could schedule a time and open it up to the entire consortium. Um, and feature that demo. And then it would be available to more like folks. Okay. And that way there we're... are those that will be much more interested in some of those features. Than okay. Others. So I'll schedule that for some time next week. Um, if folks, I mean, 
It's one of those things that I can't record it because it was a training done by Equinox and not us. So when I show it, it's just going to be showing it. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to decide is whether <laughs> I just choose a time and whoever can show up shows up because we're going to definitely have more um, training on 3.6 before we actually upgrade. And those will be scheduled later as well. Um, so people have other opportunities. Something I forgot to mention is that um, Evergreen is having their conference online next week. So Tuesday through Thursday, I'll be attending a bunch of sessions online for the Evergreen conference. And I'm sure I'll glean stuff from the conference that I'll want to share with folks too. So I'll probably schedule something for Monday, Monday or Friday of next week to, to go ahead and show this demo. Sounds good. Okay. Because then you'll be able to give any input from, from whatever else you've learned and gathered. And, yeah. um, are there other things that we would want to spend any time talking about or Dia? Yes. Could I ask, is it possible maybe to schedule that to be run a couple of different times? Yeah. So that depending on the schedules of the libraries, et cetera, um, since we're not, since we're here for folks to be able to choose one or two different times, maybe. Okay. If you think it's something of value that, you know, folks might get out of, that's, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I definitely think it is. Um, and if I do it on my own using a test server, I don't have any objections to recording that and putting that up on the website either. Um, so that's another possibility. I just, because of proprietary, I don't want to put something that Equinox has made available to us as a support client um, versus being public on YouTube, that kind of thing. Um, I want to respect their their rights to their property, but um, it has some some good things. Um, the course reserves module can be used for more than just community colleges. Um, some public libraries have used it to um, put things on display. Um, you know, and put certain items in that display reserve course um, so that it's easier to bring things up. So anyway, there's other applications in the public realm as well. Um, so it's not just for community colleges. Beth, would it be appropriate to say, I'm gonna focus on uh, community colleges on this one and public libraries on another one? Um, I think, I think that would limit it too much. Um, and because I don't have a lot of examples in the public realm, I don't know that there's enough material to separate. Um, otherwise that would be a good idea. And I think once we've used it more, we might find more application, um, for the feature. All right. Um, other questions, COVID jokes? I don't know. Are you guys seeing CC jokes? <laughs> are you guys seeing a lessening of um, COVID requirements? Um, do you see the library going back to the way things were? I guess I'm just asking if you're seeing I mean, a shift my experience right now my experience we've been open as much as possible and so my staff are, are kind of accustomed to it we are not seeing a ton of people coming in still we are seeing some more we are seeing some growth in that 
taking time. Um, and we don't provide seating. We don't put a lot of seating, moved some seating back in. Um, you know, we haven't had a lot of questions about masking yet. Um, I expect that to happen as we get more and more into summer and it becomes less comfortable. Um, but, you know, honestly, the state really hasn't come out with any anything really different for us, okay. I don't think. And um, it's still kind of that thing of, you know, I, I've got certain staff that I know are vaccinated. So when we meet, we don't worry about a mask. Uh, other staff that are not probably going to do that. They're probably not going to vaccinate. And so, you know, when I'm in a group setting, I'm still wearing a mask to try to help everybody be comfortable and stuff. So it's that's a real mixed bag still. I don't see it. I don't see a, a night and day change coming at all. Yeah, that sounds about like where we are in Legrand, and the whole allowed in if you're vaccinated thing is kind of irrelevant because yeah. we can't really ask people for medical information. So, no. sounds like we're just going to require masks when you come in here. But Monday, yesterday, the first day we were open after all of the guidance stuff changed over that short, short span of time, we had somebody in here the very first day after it changed who threw a stink and yelled at staff because we wouldn't let him in without a mask on. And the staff here owns the store here in town and apparently he went down there and did the exact same thing down there. So we kept a door testing everybody, so. We set a date of June 1st to make mask wear optional. My priority was having all staff have the um, option to be vaccinated and go through their fully vaccinated two weeks afterward. So we'll be, we'll have reached that here, uh, I think at the end of the week. And I read that 99, over 99% of <clears throat> hospitalized cases since the first of the year were unvaccinated people. So uh, I'm comfortable with letting people take their own risk with their own health, but not with the staff and we'll, and we'll be good. Yeah, I've seen lots of, uh, there's been an increase in the number of states that have um, stop the mask mandate. Um, so we we'll just have to see what Oregon, Oregon does living in Idaho. I'm seeing something different. Um, <laughs> and so I was just curious as to what your experience was and, and what your libraries were doing. Yeah, you go to Idaho and there are no masks. Correct. <laughs> <around in stores. laughs> I, I love uh, it. So I love it. I difference. have to say. <laughs> uh, yeah. I wouldn't mind it so much if people who, who were keep running into coughing, sneezing, just nodding people with no mask on and Wow, maybe it's just a cold. Maybe it's coronavirus. You know, you don't know. <laughs> or allergies, so. Ryan. It's allergies. It could season. be that too. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It could be that too, but you don't know if you don't know the person. Don't know. Yeah. I'm thinking, trying to think of a way to put something into our code of conduct that would allow us to address somebody who's exhibiting symptoms that you know are consistent with a pandemic or, you know, a public health hazard. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a challenging thing, but that's essentially what we've done with our, um, uh, since the pandemic began, if somebody was exhibiting coughing, sneezing mm -hmm. like that, we could ask them to leave. Yeah. I think we have something like that in our stuff already. I don't know that we've ever actually enforced it. I don't know why. So I have another quick question um, in regard to the courier. Are folks still um, quarantining materials? 
because I know the state had my staff back. wants. To, okay, go ahead. My staff wants us to. We're only doing like a twenty-four hour thing. Okay, they're not ready to give it up yet. So, anybody else? We stopped after the state dropped us. Yeah. To warning levels or whatever they're calling them of pandemic. Mm. So we haven't been for two or three weeks, something like that. So. I'm still quarantining things that come in the book drop, but I figure if it came in the courier, it's probably already been quarantined 24 hours. Yeah. So I'm doing a 24 hour of things that show up in the book drop. Okay, well, I have a message on the OPAC still <laughs> from um, when we started all this and things were taking longer. Uh, because of being in quarantine, I was hoping to remove that message from the OPAC um, talking about potential delays for resource sharing. Is there any objection to removing that message? I think most people have dropped it to 24 hours at most, really. So that's not much of a delay worth being concerned about, worth announcing, I think. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and remove the message. We can always add it back in um, if we find circumstances require it. So can I ask a totally odd question? We, we talked about why wow, wow Brary last time, I think, and I think a few of us are doing more with that. Mm -hmm. I know my library is, and, and we're happy with it to, to at this point. Beth, what, what, what we're curious about is how does the, how does it identify a new book? Is it when we put it out for circulation or is it when you, when it's loaded as a, as an item? Do we have any idea where that happens? It, it appears to be um, based upon the create date of the item. Um, yeah. Yeah, Perry and I are doing a little bit of comparison between our the carousels that we have and Wowberry because we're noticing that some of the things that Wowberry um, has are not in the carousels, but that might be a local baker issue. Um, so I'm trying to no, narrow that down. It puts it in down. our library list the second it's added to the, the second the item record is added. Yeah. Because it takes us a few days to get them covered and people will come in and say, hey, I got this in my library. <laughs> and it's, yeah, they get anxious the for it. Area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. We're just trying to identify because we, we, you know, if our person is out for a week, is that what's causing, uh, you know, a, a not so interesting newsletter or yeah. You know, what, what we're trying to just figure that trigger point. So, yeah, if you're not adding items, it, there's not going to be much in your Wowberry newsletter. Mm hmm. <laughs> kind of boring. But it, you can think it with library to go. So, you know, and they're doing regular collections. Uh, and I editions. I think, although I'm not sure that Wowberry may be grabbing freeding things sometimes yeah or in your maybe case, every time because somebody put a linda fairstein book that showed up in there the other day on hold and then it turned out to be a book from 2014 that they'd read back in 2014 and the only thing i can think of is that it was a a new oh. reading item mm -hmm. so so yeah, you can you can sync it with yeah. all of those services yes so the 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 freeding um titles um, we're adding to the catalog for Legrand. Um, so mm -hmm. they're actually in the catalog. They don't have items. So that yeah. was, that's what makes me curious about how Wowberry is finding them. Yeah. So that might be something we have to I investigate. 
it may be based on bib records then and the bib record doesn't link to Legrand at all if we haven't added an item for it because then we're not associated with it in you know the Legrand segment of the catalog you know what I mean but since the freeding records are being uploaded just for Legrand they do show up huh that makes sense yeah I guess I'm just thinking about how could it be based upon the bib create date if there's people who add to it later um yeah but it would be a new item for them um even though the bib's older yeah so there might be I mean, some it has questions to be doing that somehow. yeah we might have to ask wildberry get some answers yeah. Okay, so folks are needing oh, to leave, to to. so we should probably we more people wrap up. Off. <laughs> yeah. So, do we need an agenda to? Or do we? No, do, we don't need an agenda. We have we've done our agenda. Yes, we, we have. Need a motion to adjourn the meeting. A motion to adjourn. I will make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Okay. I'll second. All right. All those in favor. Turn off your meeting. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate <laughs> your all time, all your time, and everything. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. All right. Bye bye. Thanks, Beth.